the typical political trajectory is someone who has this interest in politics. Let's take Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, if he would have followed the advice of his family, of his friends of the circle that he grew up in, never would have gone into politics. This was in the early 1880s. Because politics in Gilded Age America was considered a rather low calling. And people who went into politics were assumed to be corrupt, were assumed to be uneducated, who were assumed to be fundamentally dishonest, not the sort of people you had into polite households, not the kind of person you would let your daughter marry. But Theodore Roosevelt went into politics nonetheless. When he went into politics, he had no idea that he could ever become president. And for the very good reason that he only became president by accident. And it was, as he later himself admitted, that uh, it was a stroke of luck, uh, the bad luck of William McKinley in getting assassinated when he was vice president that did it. Theodore Roosevelt never could have gotten elected on his own, not the first time. He could get reelected but not elected the first time. But he did become president. And the fact that he could become president only dawned on him maybe two or three years before he became president. That's usually the kind of late dawning, the late uh, recognition that you might be president. But Franklin Roosevelt was different because there was a family member who had been president. I have to make exception for people like John Quincy Adams whose father had been president of the United States. So John Quincy Adams recognized that you could do this sort of thing. Now, I'll share a personal experience with you. Um, and I will confess that I think biographers especially, authors of all sorts, historians, but especially biographers, reveal, if you know how to read it, reveal in their interpretation of the individuals they study something of their own experience simply because a biography is a study in human nature. And we all have our theories of human nature. We don't necessarily call them theories, but just our understanding of the way people work. And so what you understand, what you infer about an individual, reflects the kinds of things that you have gathered about the way humans work. And so when I think about Franklin Roosevelt, and the fact that he had this cousin who, interestingly enough, became his uncle by marriage. It was a fifth cousin, once removed. And so he married, Franklin Roosevelt married Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the niece of Theodore Roosevelt. So that Eleanor Roosevelt, upon marrying, became Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt leading Theodore Roosevelt to congratulate the groom at the wedding. And he said, Franklin, good for you. There's nothing like keeping the name in the family. <laughs> anyway, Franklin Roosevelt now had this model for what he could become. And when I said I was going to share a personal experience, as I mentioned at the beginning, my son has decided to become a historian. Now, partly it's because he's interested in history. But I know some of it reflects the fact that he's watched me do it for a while, for most of his life. And I know he has concluded, because he's been candid enough to share it with me, uh, he has concluded, how hard can it be? My old man's been doing it all these years. <laughs> Such is the lack of respect of you. But anyway, Franklin Roosevelt, at the age of 22, shortly after he got out of college, announced to some of his fellow workers, he took an internship at a law firm in New York, he announced to some of his fellow workers that he was going to become president. That was his, his goal. And he mapped out his strategy, the steps he was going to take to become president. And he said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is to enter New York state politics. I think I'll get elected to the New York legislature. And then after that, I will campaign for the national ticket, and I will take appointment to a federal position. And the federal position I have my eye on is Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And then after a stint in Washington, I will come back to New York, and I will be elected governor of New York. 
and then I will be prime presidential timber. Well, in fact, that was exactly the trajectory that Theodore Roosevelt had followed. There's a story that goes, and I haven't been able to confirm this. There's a story that goes um, that uh, says that Franklin Roosevelt, in accord with following, well, he was cousin Ted, now he's Uncle Ted, um, that he followed, he decided he was going to follow Uncle Ted in another critical measure, and he told his wife Eleanor, and we're going to have six children just like Uncle Ted had six children. And she says, what do you mean, we? Who do you think is going to have these children? <laughs> now, as a matter of fact, they did have six children. Ah, but anyway, that's another story. And it's uh, actually an absolutely critical part of the story, which I'm going to get to in a moment. But anyway, Franklin Roosevelt was that rare potential candidate for president who could imagine well in advance that he would be president and could not simply imagine it, but have a kind of reasonable and, um, and recognizable path to the presidency. And he, in fact, followed that precise path. He was elected to the New York State Legislature. He campaigned for the Democratic ticket. Now, here's an important distinction. Whereas Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican, Franklin Roosevelt was a Democrat. But they were less different in that regard than you might guess because Theodore Roosevelt was always a maverick among the Republicans. He should have been a Democrat in terms of his political philosophy. But there was a reason, an accident of history, that caused him to be a Republican rather than a Democrat. He grew up in New York City in, during and shortly after the Civil War. And for Theodore Roosevelt's generation, the Democratic Party was always the party of the rebellion. And furthermore, since he grew up in New York City, it was the party of Tammany Hall, which was corrupt. It was a big enough step for Theodore Roosevelt to enter politics at all. But to have entered politics in the Democratic Party would have been too much. Franklin Roosevelt actually came from a Democratic family in upstate New York. And this was actually a bit of an anomaly, because most of upstate New York was Republican. But his family consisted of Democrats, so he went into the Democratic Party. He was elected to the New York State Legislature. He campaigned for the Democratic ticket in 1912, and when Woodrow Wilson was elected, Wilson needed people to fill positions. This is the way you get assistant secretaries of the Navy. And Wilson asked Franklin Roosevelt what job he might like. Uh, he could have dreamed about being a cabinet secretary, but he wasn't quite that helpful to the ticket, which in those days meant that he, well, not just those days, um, it meant that he hadn't given enough money to the campaign. Uh, he had done enough for the campaign to merit a number two position, so he asked for assistant secretary of the Navy. And people recognized that there was that connection and all of a sudden began to see what Franklin Roosevelt's ambitions were. Now, when I said that Franklin Roosevelt eventually became the most powerful man in the history of the world, he had good training for that. American presidents are almost never chosen for their expertise, their experience, even their serious thought about foreign affairs. We as a people almost never elect presidents based on their foreign policy. Very often, we elect presidents whose foreign policy we know almost nothing about. And you can include the current president. The election of 2000 was not fought out over foreign policy because at that time, no one had any idea that 9-11 was just around the corner. We had spent 10 years since the end of the Cold War, and foreign policy seemed to have taken a holiday. This is the norm rather than the exception. Woodrow Wilson, who was elected in 1912, was elected having said almost not a word on foreign policy. In fact, when Woodrow Wilson was about to be inaugurated, he told a journalist friend who kindly for us historians wrote it down. Uh, Wilson said, it would be the irony of history if foreign policy figured large in my administration. Well, of course, it was the irony of history because foreign policy swallowed up his administration. 